term. And uh, I know there's another one who is also, who has that trait in his personality as well, which is uh, Goran Svilanovic. Goran, you have the floor. And please use the left microphone. That's, yeah, thank you. Left is okay, not very popular, but okay. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to you, Ulrike, to colleagues of yours who are co-hosting us today. Of course, I'd like to express my gratitude to Zvezdan and her team in the Center for Democracy and Reconciliation for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to share several personal photos from my memory with you rather than deliver a big political or bureaucratic speech. I very much enjoy celebrating uh, Djurjevdan, May the 6th, uh, when I was a child in Gilane, in Kosovo, watching, observing from my terrace, uh, Roma ladies gathering together early in the morning in these beautiful national costumes, shalvare, white, pink, green, yellow, and they were days dancing the way I will never forget. I don't know whether these are my first erotic memories, but these are my memories that I very much like. Listening to the music they were playing from Montarbo and Marshall, before Marshall Yatsirko. <laughs> and uh, this is what I brought. Of course, this was also a day in which uh, Muslims from Gilane, Albanians and Turks and Roma were using to do to actually make a big parade in the city because the young boys were circumcised at that day quite often and uh, it was a very festive day for us the serbs because it was may the 6th for romas because it was may the 6th and they were gathering and it was a very festive day but also for the others turks and albanians who also were part of the celebration. This is one photo which I did not find in the book. Another photo I did not buy in the book is that uh, I was drafted to fight NATO in 1999 when Serbia was bombed. And then only a year and a half later, I was together with a group of generals in the, here in Brussels in the NATO headquarters as this was the first ever post-war visit, and I'm very much proud. And then it was 2004 that I brought my daughter. I was attending a TV show in Zagreb, very popular TV show, the one that ended up with a scandal the other day, and was given an interview. And my daughter, who was 12 then, while enjoying a coffee, a juice for her in the center, was asking, are we in a foreign country? We passed the border. I said, yes. But they speak our language. I can understand them. Well, I said, yeah, this is still another country, and you need to understand that it is. And this was uh, early summer 2004, and then it was summer, hot, very hot in Sarajevo in 2013, <coughs> the day after Croatia joined the EU, I was with my son in Sarajevo, and he was asking, while eating Cevapšići, these girls with a scarf, they're Muslims? He said, yes, they are. Uh -huh. And these very hot, semi-naked girls, they're talking to them, he said, they're Muslims as well. But how come Muslims speak in our language? He said, well, Bosniaks, yes, they do. And, but why are that many around dressed like this? I said, well, you know, if you feel you're jeopardized and in danger based on something which is part of your identity, religion, language, whatever, you try to develop and to show that you have survived and that you are around. And this is exactly what, was, what I felt in July by visiting Srebrenica, a thousands of people just walking to send one signal, one message, we are still around, we are alive, we are. Well, these are the photos. And I'm, of course, not very proud to say that while I was together with many others, 
believing that I'm making history, I missed a moment to teach my son and my daughter a bit of a history that they've missed completely. This might be part of the reason why we are faced with a different Balkans and different Europe today. It is much more integrated into the EU, but politically speaking, these boys and girls who have not seen, who have not, uh, who have not had any experience from Yugoslavia, and who have not seen coffins coming back from the battles, we entrusted them with the future of Balkans and the future of Europe. But please be aware, they are full of hormones, full of passion for the new identity they do not necessarily share with the father, because they have unfortunately nothing to do these days with neither Kosovo, nor Croatia, nor Bosnia, as I did while I was growing up in, at that time, Yugoslavia but only the Serb, and I guess their friends are Croatian or Bosnian or Albanian identity, they are the future of the Balkans, and we need to reinvest our emotion and our time in re-educating them. And re-educating is an attempt you've done, and I would like to praise uh, those who have inspired this work Historians who are somewhere there, seated, I hope they will be speaking in many other events, explaining how did they agree or disagree, what they were written. So the generation which is going to run Europe in the coming decades will be at least aware of the joint past that we share, their parents, and it will be responsible in the manner they're going to run it. Johan, in all frankness, I want to say something to you and through you to MEPs and others in Brussels. Business as usual is absolutely impossible if we want to see Europe united and the Balkans in. After what we've seen recently, Brexit, migration crisis, new nationalism in southeastern Europe, new nationalism in old Europe, election results in Washington and in this part where I come from, please understand, business as usual is the only wrong policy. Everything else which really addresses the feelings of the people who have been neglected, of the youth who have been misinformed, is going to win the future. I really believe in it, very much so, and therefore I really believe that an attempt, I'm not saying this is the best history book, I don't know, to be very frank, but an attempt to agree on the facts with the colleagues at the other side of the border is a huge success, and I would like to pay my respect to all of you guys who have done this. Thank you. I take the left one. I take the left one. Thank you very much, much Goran, also for this personal account on, on your own, of your own experience, especially also with your, with your children. And I can, I can definitely agree with you that in times that we are living now, business as usual also for us as in the European Union is something that uh, cannot be done anymore. We need to change our way of, of working, our way of looking at things, but for sure also, and that is part of the, of the teaching and the importance to teach the young ones. Um, to, to look at what the facts are, because what we're living right now is a lot of people claiming we have the truth, and it's the only truth, and there's nothing else that is true. And especially with social media, this gets around a lot faster than we had when I was young. Yeah? So the necessity to teach also young people the, the critical thinking, to not believe everything an authority says, 
or the media say, or the social media say. I think this is essential, and I hope that with uh, what we are presenting here today, this, this book and the project, at least some, um, some effort can be done in order to achieve that at a, to a higher level. Now, the last one of the opening speeches is Mr. Erhard Bursek, well known to all those of us who have been working in the Balkans for many years. Um, Erhard, you have the floor.